great honor to be here. It's my first time actually in Helsinki. And uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is actually very much on China's role in global development. The world economy has changed dramatically, fundamentally, over the past 20 years. Since the late 1990s, there has been a transformation, a shift of power towards the rising powers. So China's economic and political influence in low-income developing countries has increased significantly in recent years. And it has already a major impact on low-income countries through different channels. Those are the, perhaps the examples of the channels of influence of China on the other developing countries. So in terms of trade and also FDI finance, development assistance, governance, migration, and also environmental impacts, so there are various of channels of influence of China on the other developing countries, especially in Africa and Asia. We all know Chinese engagement in Africa perhaps is right now is one of the most debatable topic and also one of the hottest topic in the world. Back to IDS, my students quite often ask me this question. You know, when you look at uh, Chinese outward FDI, Africa counts, counts about uh, less than 5% of China's uh, total mm -hmm. outward FDI. And Latin America is about 18% of China's uh, total outward FDI. And then why China in Africa is such a big story <laughs> and not China in Latin America? So that's this, you know, have this to do with the global development uh, mm -hmm. agenda setting. So this, those are the interesting questions I hope we can discuss uh, in the next 20 minutes. And also, China has emerged with uh, increased influence in global fora and in international institutions. As most of you know, China has just uh, hosted the G20 summit in Hangzhou three weeks ago. And one of the legacies of the Chinese presidency of the G20 is actually about, uh, you know, well, according to some scholars, uh, this G20 summit is uh, perhaps uh, the most inclusive G20 summit in the history. Certainly, the Chinese government invited uh, many developing country leaders as guests uh, and also uh, many consultations uh, with the developing countries later. It's much more beyond the scope of the G20 countries. So, and also, so with this increased influence in the global uh, institutions, and also its relative presence and influence uh, in the poorest countries in Asia and Africa, the better dialogue and the mutual understanding is needed. So what are the, but before I talk about China, I think it's important we have some knowledge about the background of global development. What are the main challenges of global economic governance and the global development? So the fundamental realities of today's globalizing world is definitely the growing interconnectedness in the domain of economics, but significantly also in political, social, and cultural spheres. And also this, with globalization, authority and power over development policies negotiated between the various agencies, making it all more complex process to work through. Taking China as, uh, in Africa as an example, it's not as simple as some people thought it's all about oil and the natural resource. In fact, it's much more complicated than that because we are talking about uh, more than 32 Chinese provinces and more than 54 African countries. So there are diversified actors and also the, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, power you know, over the development policy and uh, it's negotiated between the different levels. 
So another reality is, uh, of course, the world is changing beyond the immediate consequences of the global financial crisis. The major shift is underway in power towards the developing world and the emerging economies. But uh, for a long while, you know, the global markets and the institutions could not serve the needs of people in developing countries. And the large emerging markets have responded by establishing new initiatives, such as the, the BRICS uh, New Development Bank, the NDB, and also this uh, Asia Infrastructure Development Bank, and also other multilateral initiatives. Taking the AIB Bank is, is, as an example, it's not just a simply an a, a infrastructure investment bank. In fact, uh, you know, it's much more beyond that. To some extent, uh, it will change the way of multilateral engagement. And also, the, uh, at the moment, uh, China is promoting the use of uh, its uh, renminbi is in a multi-currency international monetary system. So this definitely a role in the global economic uh, system, both for Bretton Woods institutions uh, and the, the uh, emerging uh, countries. So how to make them work uh, together more effectively? And there are lots of challenges, especially you know, in terms of constraints to global growth and uh, development the issues of resource scarcities and global instability, and how this is to be managed. This is a fundamental challenge of global development. In fact, uh, several years ago, one of the, the uh, well, Professor John Beddington, the former chief scientific advisor to the UK government, uh, gave a uh, his, uh, you know, uh, perspective on the perfect, he called it the perfect storm of global events to describe uh, the scarcity of the natural resource. As you can see, according to this uh, uh, graph, uh, we are facing serious challenge in terms of uh, the uh, global resource. So what's the implication for development cooperation? Certainly, global development is, has reached a critical turning point. With the growing role of China and also other non-traditional donors, many have asked the question, what the future of development might look like? And whether a new post-2015 global partnership might be possible. So this is, uh, when we think about China, the key issues relating to China is, where does China as a growing power, investor, consumer, and donor fit within the specific uh, regional and global development regime? And what can we explain and understand by development as is understood and practiced within China? Those are all the key questions if you want to understand China's overseas investment and also its overseas activity. You need to understand you know, the, what happened in China itself. The, so for, for example, in terms of the uh, Chinese engagement in Africa, there are key, four key features uh, distinguish the aid uh, to Africa by traditional donors from Africa. First, the, the traditional donors uh, very much, you know, impose uh, policy reforms uh, as the preconditions uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, for its aid. Whilst China do not impose uh, policy conditions, but that's not completely true. In fact, China does have condition one condition, which is one China. 
Yeah, they, this is mainly was uh, Taiwan's uh, engagement with Africa. So one China is China's policy condition in Africa. And second, unlike traditional donors, China generally deliver aid to Africa through projects rather than general budget support. And thirdly, very importantly, you know, the traditional donors increasingly provide more support to the social sectors. While China and also the other emerging powers like India and Brazil uh, focus more on infrastructure and uh, productive sectors. So which approach is better? Here, in fact, this question is quite meaningless if you do not consider you know, the location and the development stage of the country. So very much depends on who you are and where you are. And the fourth, you know, while well, China linked aid to trade and also other commercial activities, uh, traditional donors do not mix aid uh, with uh, commercial activities. Perhaps uh, the only exception of OECD DAC is very much the South Korea. Its approach is quite, uh, in a way, quite similar to China. So are we actually heading towards a new global economic order? We all know the Brighton Woods system, basically. To some extent, the Brighton Woods institution still reflect a US-dominated world economic order. The current system failed to deliver governance reforms. That's why the new emerging powers will continue to create their own institutions and their own frameworks of global economic governance and the global governance, and which could lead to fragment, uh, fragmentation of the global economic system. So what's, what's the way forward? Actually, my key point is uh, there's a great, uh, great deal of debate over the question of uh, how to work with uh, the emerging economies to include them in the existing systems of global governance and uh, development cooperation. But in fact, we are asking the wrong question. We should really ask a different question here. The real question should be what lessons can the existing systems of global economic governance and development cooperation take from South-South cooperation in order to draw together more closely the process of North-South and South-South cooperation. So there's a need to have some common understanding of the principles of the partnership and also create a network supporting multilateral dialogue and cooperations at all levels, especially at this era of you know, one by one crisis. So use, uh, let me end by using a Chinese, a traditional Chinese thing means the opportunity knocks but once, so we must make the most of it. I think we now live in the best time of the multilateral engagement and also the global development. So we must take the opportunity and to help to, to shape the, the new global economic order. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>